This video covers, um, it's going to repeat the material that was in Tuesday's class because um, a fair number of you weren't able to make it uh, and go into it in somewhat more detail. So we're going to be talking about mathematical models that are useful for computer systems. Uh, first, we'll talk about cues. And to introduce them, we'll first talk about an arrival process. So that's just a fancy name for if we say that time goes across here, that something happens, events happen at instants in time. You know, uh, requests to a web server, packets arriving at a switch, uh, requests for disk blocks, something like that. And so um, <clears throat> in our models, we're going to be looking at how the system handles these arrivals. And so we need a mathematical model for those arrivals. And we're going to use um, the easy model. And the one that we're going to talk about in this class is what's called memoryless arrivals. And you'll see what this means as we go through this. Um, essentially, it means that at any point in time, whether or not an event happens is memoryless. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have any uh, correlation with past activity. So the simplest arrival process like this is what's called a Bernoulli process. And this is a discrete time process. So we say that time is divided into slots. Um, you know, formally, formally we have, you know, x sub i is either 0 or 1 i equals, you know, for i is some integer. Um, a lot of times you can use a discrete model for a continuous system and you just divide time up into slots. This might be a second, it might be a single CPU cycle, whatever. So a Bernoulli process just picks uh, with probability p, it picks a one, an event, and 1 minus p, uh, there's no event. So for instance, we could flip a coin and decide whether there's an arrival in each slot. So you know, the first one, we say there's an arrival. The second one, no arrival. Third one, no arrival. Fourth one, an arrival. Um, and so on. And if we're doing this by actually flipping a coin, then we know that the chance of an arrival in any one of these slots is exactly p, if it's a fair coin, 1 half, regardless of anything that happened in the past or in the future. So the um, Obviously, the mean number of arrivals per slot is p. And then the inter-arrival time is distributed over 0, 1, 2, and so on, because obviously if we have an arrival here, the next arrival could be there. And so there's no gaps between the two. Uh, so the inter-arrival time um, is, well, what's the probability that it's 0? Zero? 0, it's just, so we have a 1 here. What's the chance that this is a 1? It's p. Uh, 1. Well, it's 1 minus p, 
that we got a zero here plus p that we got a zero here and so on. So for k it's 1 minus p uh, to the k times p. So the distribution of these interarrival times is what's known as a geometric distribution on 0, 1, 2. Um, and so in particular, say we have a 1 here, what's the probability that it's 0? Well, the chance that there's an arrival here, so that's p. 1, well, we have to have no arrival here and an arrival here and so on and so for k it's going to be 1 minus p to the k times p. Um, the mean of this distribution is going to be 1 minus p over p. So for instance for a coin flip where our probability is 1 half the inter arrival the mean inter arrival time will be 1 1 half over 1 half. If the probability of an arrival is one-tenth, then it's going to be 0.9 over 0.1, so it's going to be 9. Equals 1, you know, one-tenth, that equals 9, and so on. Clearly, uh, it goes up which makes sense. The lower the rate of arrivals, the longer the time between arrivals. Now, if we were to graph this out, we would see something that looks like this. So say, um, in the case of, you know, one half, we get uh, the probability of zero is one half, the probability of one so let's bring that out to here. The probability of 1 is a quarter and so on. So this is p equals 1 half. If we did p equals 1 tenth, we'd have 1 tenth. I mean this is inexact but you get the idea, you know, it would go down much more slowly. Now, consider the case where, let's say, we divide time into seconds, and we say we have a Bernoulli process with rate one half, so that means that each second P equals one half. Now let's create a second process. So here, our quantum, well, I'll call it our slot, is one second. And here, our slot is one half second. Now, and here we go, p is one quarter. Now these two processes have the same arrival rate. Each of them is going to have a total, an average arrival rate of one half an event per second. Here you tw try twice per second and you've got a chance of one quarter each time. Here you try once per second with a chance of a half. So what we'll see is that um, the probability for one of them is <coughs> The inter-arrival time for one of them is going to be, it's going to look like this, whereas the, um, the inter-arrival time, the probability for another is going to look uh, Order. 
but essentially these two oh actually yes so in fact if we were to make finer and finer uh, gradations here we would see that in fact these would converge to a single you know to a, a line a curve and so that is our exponential inter-arrival time distribution and here our rate is lambda so that means that we have um, a mean inter-arrival time of 1 over lambda equals mean inter-arrival time and if we're looking at time going forward the probability of an arrival in any interval of width epsilon is um, is epsilon uh, times lambda sorry so what this means is that in any small interval epsilon the probability of an arrival is epsilon times lambda um, or at least that's the limit as epsilon approaches zero as epsilon gets bigger of course there's a chance of multiple arrivals um, and so this is essentially the limit of you know taking ever finer steps of geometric of Bernoulli distributions is what we call the Poisson the Poisson or memoryless uh, continuous memoryless arrival model and <clears throat> because it's memoryless that means that for instance at any point in time you see the same distribution of inter of times until the next arrival whether that point in time is the last arrival whether it's a random time that you arrive here and so on so each of these arrivals is independent and the you know and the time until the arrival comes is independent of how long you've been waiting so this is a good model for some things and not for others um, in particular for a lot of physical systems for an individual system it may not be a good model um, I had mentioned a paper from fast talking about uh, you know disk failure rates and raid if you think about it you know you've got a disk and you know at time zero it gets manufactured you go through time at some point in time it fails now it's unlikely that that disk has um, you know that that disk has an equal probability of failing at each instant at the beginning it's new you know it gets older over time it's a process you know the physical wear on something is a process that of course has memory it occurs and it gets worse uh, you have time varying conditions um, which if you can have multiple failures then they may be clustered together during a particularly bad um, period of you know environmental period and so on so for um, another example would be you know if you're sitting at your at your screen and you know and you've got a web browser open and you're clicking um, you know you're clicking on um, a web page you're sending get requests out to the server um, say you're sending searches to Google now the these are uh, these events aren't likely to be well modeled by a memoryless arrival process because there's only you know you can't um, you know you're going to spend a bit of time in between clicking to actually look at the results you're going to go away for periods of time and do something else and come back 
So you don't have that, you know, that fundamental idea that there's an equal probability at each unit of time doesn't seem to apply here. However, if you take if you take a lot of users and you look at their request to a single server, now this may well be uh, is close to memoryless because your arrival rate now is in the you know perhaps hundreds of requests per second and the the uh, you know the correlation between events in a single user stream is broken up because that user is <coughs> interleaved with thousands of others so in particular the probability that one of these 10,000 people clicks on the search button in the next millisecond is probably roughly constant um, you know for some period of time as the day goes on it may grow or uh, shrink but it's um, you know for shorter periods it's going to behave very much like memoryless arrivals so in particular much like the law of large numbers aggregation uh, tends towards a memoryless distribution uh, because as you ag or rather aggregation of independent arrivals um, tends towards a memoryless distribution because you don't know which because any one of those uh, sources could be responsible for the next arrival so now we have our simple arrival model. It's a memoryless arrival model in continuous time with an equal probability in any, at any instant of an arrival. Um, a queue we represent like this. We've got, um, so we have an arrival process with rate equals lambda. We have a server which processes, which processes jobs with rate equals mu. So that means mean service time is uh, 1 over mu, just like mean inter-arrival time is 1 over lambda. And as jobs arrive, they queue up in the queue in, and get served in order. And so we'll look at what are called MM1 queues, which means memoryless arrivals, memoryless service time, and then one server. So for instance, you can have queues that have multiple servers. You know, if, uh, if anyone goes to the bank anymore and you have a single line for multiple bank tellers, it's a model like that. It behaves slightly differently. And then clearly it gets much more complicated once you get to non-memoryless distributions. Uh, general inter-arrival time and service distributions are hard. Okay, a key parameter here is the utilization rho which equals lambda over mu. So if we have arrivals coming in at rate one half and we're able to service them at rate one then the system is 50 percent utilized. Uh, lambda over mu is one half. Uh, for stability we need lambda is strictly less than mu or rho is less than one uh, because clearly if um, in our simplified model um, if 
arrivals when they come wait in line and never leave until they're serviced and so if the arrival rate in the long term is greater than the service rate then the queue will grow without bounds. Um, now and if the utilization is exactly one um, we can't guarantee that it won't grow beyond any particular bound and so we can't calculate an average and we can't calculate an expected queue length. Okay, so we can say a few things about about the system based on the utilization. First of all, the probability that the server is idle is 1 minus rho because it's busy um, you know clearly it's got to be if its utilization is one half it's busy half the time uh, the other half of the time it's idle and that's also going to be the probability that the queue length is zero because the rules say that if there's a job in the queue the server has to process it so it can't be idle when there's um, when there's a job in the queue so we have the queue length uh, zero has probability one minus rho. Turns out for memoryless, this is looking like our geometric distribution, and in fact, the expected value of the Q length is going to be. Um, row over 1 minus row for memoryless arrivals. And so that means that in particular it behaves very poorly as you approach a utilization of 1. So let's say we have a utilization of 1 half. It's going to be you know, 1. Uh, 3 fourths. going to be 3, 7 eighths, it's going to be 7, you know, 99 percent, it's going to be 99. Essentially, the Q length tends towards infinity as, um, as rho approaches 1. Uh, so, in particular, this is well, and this is somewhat of a non-intuitive result. It means that even when you have a significant amount of uh, spare capacity, so in the case where the system is has a utilization of three fourths, so a quarter of the time it's still free, but your average queue length is still going to be three. Um, and as you try to achieve full utilization if you really do have memoryless arrivals and you know no closed system where the rate of arrivals goes down as your uh, queue length goes up then in fact your uh, delay increases you know without bounds as you get towards a hundred percent the next thing we'll look at is Little's theorem So Little's theorem relates the following variables. L is the line length, the number of jobs in the system. Lambda, which we know is the arrival rate. And W is the, uh, is the mean time um, in the system for a single job. And so basically it's it just states that L equals lambda W, that the number of jobs in the system is the arrival rate times the amount of time each job waits. And it's maybe easiest 
visualized in a deterministic system. So let's say we have jobs <coughs> arriving with a rate of 1. So here we have job number, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so, and have each job take one unit of time in the system. So, it's straightforward to see here that, you know, that L equals 1. Now, what happens if each job took, um, took, uh, spent two units of time in the system? Well, in that case, job one, job two, job three, job four, job five, and now we see that L is the number of jobs in the system is two and so on and in fact no matter what the arrival process is and no matter what the service time process is um, you know so we can juggle these things around we still end up with essentially you have to put the job somewhere um, if you know if jobs are taking longer in the system than than uh, the average inter-arrival time, then we're going to have more than one job in the system. If jobs are taking, are spending less time in the system on average than the inter-arrival time, then we're going to have something that looks like this. and the number of jobs in the system on average is going to be less than one because we're going to have these blank spaces here. Um, and so, you know, this is just, it's a simple identity. Essentially, like I said, if you've, if the jobs, you've got to put the job somewhere. Um, you know, the, and so it's a direct relationship between the average wait time, the arrival rate, and the queue length. Um, and it lets you, for instance, if you measure queue lengths and arrival times, you could estimate wait times without, without ever um, having to, you know, actually instrument that yourself. Uh, this holds for any arrival time distribution, any service time distribution, because as I said, it's just, it's a simple mathematical identity. Okay. The next thing we'll talk about is Markov models. So the idea of a Markov model is that um, it's a system that has a certain number of states, kind of like a finite state machine. It has transitions between the states. And unlike a finite state machine, these transitions are spontaneous. So in particular, each transition has a rate, and that means, so if this has rate 2, that means that if we're in, um, you know, let's label our states. That means when we're in state C, um, we exit across this link. You know, at each instant in time, we decide whether to exit across this link with a rate of two or an inter-arrival time of uh, of one half. Uh, we can have, you know, this could have a rate rate one, and so that means that our total exit rate is three and since we're and we're twice as likely to exit on this link as this link um, 
and the key thing about these rates is that they're dependent you know if you I mean from the figure it's clear that we're setting it up in such a way that the rate of a transition is only affected by the state that the system is in currently so it allows you to represent a certain amount of state that state is quantified in these you know Markov states and you transition between them um, and again we're using this memoryless model uh, of well in this case we'll call it departures from a state rather than arrivals so I'll use a really simple example I use in uh, some of my lectures we've got a couch with a couple of people sitting on it we assume there's a, a TV over here somewhere and we've got a bathroom over here so our system has the following states uh, one is uh, two people on the couch a second state is one on the couch one in the bathroom and a third state is no one on the couch one at the bathroom and one waiting outside the door so let's say that each person spends a mean amount of time 30 minutes on the couch and three minutes in the bathroom um, <clears throat> now in real life there'd be a correlation with commercials here but we ignore that and so we have a model that looks like this okay now if the person in the bathroom returns to the couch we go here if uh, when this person gets out of the bathroom we return here so our model looks like this um, and that means that well let's say that we have one half hour and one uh, twentieth hour so here we have two people on the couch each of them is leaving the couch at rate two um, you know two exits per hour so that gives us a total rate of four going across here in this state there's only one person on the couch okay so in other words here we have okay here we've got one person on the couch and we've got one person in the bathroom and this person gets up with rate 2 and this person leaves with rate 20 so 2 and 20 and then here again this person in the bathroom leaves with rate 20 because the mean intra arrival time is 1 20th of an hour <clears throat> now like a queuing model the utility of a Markov model is that we can set it up and determine what the state occupancies are um, 
And in particular, that means, for instance, in this case, we can find out how likely it is that there'll be someone waiting for the bathroom. So what we do is we, uh, we set up what are called balance equations for the Markov model. And it's a set of simultaneous equations for the state occupancies, and we solve them. So we're looking for the equilibrium state. Uh, so if this system has been running for some period of time, there's going to be a steady state probability that the system's in any one of these states. And we <coughs> take advantage of the fact that over time, the total flow into a state has to be the same as the total flow out. Because if you look, essentially the state makes a walk through this graph and at the end, you know, except for the beginning and the end, any walk through this graph has to go out of any place that it went into. So over a long enough time, you can neglect the beginning and the end. And so you can say that uh, for every state, the, uh, you know, the number of times that we entered equals number of times left. And that means that if we divide it by time, we get the rate into a state equals the rate out of a state. Um, and now if you remember, we've got rates on these edges here. The problem is that those rates aren't the total flow rate across. They're the rates conditional on being in this state. So if we want to know how often the state goes across this edge, so we've got one, two, and three, we need to know the probability that we're in this state. So if we're in this state almost all the time, then, then you know, the rate across here will be close to uh, two per hour. If we're in here, you know, only 1% of the time, then the flow across here will be, um, you know, 100 times less. So in particular, the flow across um, edge, you know, state one to state two with rate R1, R1, two is the probability that we're in state one times uh, the rate across that edge. Does that make sense that the, the flow across here is directly proportional to this rate, and it's also directly proportional to the probability that we're in the source state. And so that gives us a series of equations, essentially for each state, the sum of all the incoming uh, flows. So that's state, sorry, P, J, R, J, I. So these are, you know, for some J here, uh, what's the probability that we're in this state and what's the rate that we transition to state I across that edge. And that has to equal uh, the sum of the probability that we're in state I times uh, 
you know, all these outgoing states. So we're summing across any states out there that have a non-zero rate coming in, and we're summing across any, uh, you know, any edges here that have a non-zero rate going out. So that gives us, so we've got, you know, n ver if we have n states, we have, we have one equation per state then, which is just So this gives us, um, you know, this gives us n equations for n variables. However, we actually have not fully, uh, one of these equations is going to be redundant because each of them gives you, because it's in terms of the probabilities of these states. However, we know that these are probabilities and that they cover the entire set of possibilities so they have to sum to one. So in effect we're going to remove one of these equations and then we're also going to add um, a final equation saying that the sum of the probabilities is one. So let's work it out for our case. Um, so we'll do in minus out equals zero. So for state one, we have P2 times 20 minus P1 times four equals zero. And then here in one times four, plus P3 times 20 minus P2 times 2 plus 20. So in other words, the outgoing is P2 times 2, P2 plus times 20, and then here P3, 20, P1, 4. And then finally, the third equation is redundant. We know these two probabilities. We can obtain the third one. And so instead, we put P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals 1. So for a simple system of qu equations like this, we can easily substitute, we can easily solve it by back substitution. You'll get uh, P1 equals 5 sevenths, P2 equals P3 equals 1 seventh. Um, for a more complex model, you would use standard um, you know, linear algebra techniques. You know, where in this case A equals um, negative four. So here's P1, P2, P3, negative four, 20, zero. Uh, four, negative twenty-two, two, one, 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 times p, and so, um, and so we'll just take a minus one. Um, and multiply it by our, you know, our uh, this side, and we'll get p. So we'll talk more about Markov models in class. In addition, if you're interested, I've posted a link about um, it covers a bit more detail about Little's theorem.